Uh, okay, so there's this nice um, enlightenment, modernist enlightenment idea that the scientific revolution of the uh, 16th and 17th century gave mankind the uh, way to find out the truth about the universe. There's this famous couplet by Alexander Pope, nature and nature's laws lay hid in night. God said, let Newton be and all was light. Uh, and many scientists actually complained that Newton had discovered the basic structure of the universe and all that was left was crossing T's and dotting I's, filling in the details. Uh, but then, of course, in the, uh, at the turn of the 20th century, there were two great scientific revolutions. It turned out that Newton's theory certainly wasn't the last word. Uh, in particular, it was replaced by Einstein's theory of relativity and spe special and general theories of, re of relativity. And that's really quite a, a radical change, uh, at any rate, at first glance. It, Newton assumes that uh, there's actions to distance. Gravity is an action to d a distance force. There's no uh, mediation. There's no gravitational waves or anything. And in his view, it's just straight. This, the movement of this planet affects this planet planet immediately, instantaneously. Uh, absolute space, absolute time, there's no concept of two events being simultaneous for one uh, observer but not simultaneous for another. Uh, and yet in Einstein everything's overturned. Um, the world isn't infinite as, as Newton, it's not part of the theory uh, that the uh, world is infinite as, as it's part of Newton's theory. There's no action to distance in Einstein. Uh, it is possible, famously, for two events to be simultaneous in one frame of reference and not in another, according to the th theory of relativity. So what's going on? How can science be this great bastion of truth and rationality if, if theory change as radical as that can occur? Well, the first philosopher of science who was really centrally influenced by scientific revolutions was Karl Popper, a predecessor of mine very distinguished, obviously, at, at the London School of Economics, where I teach. In, the, in fact, he set up the philosophy department. And his whole view was that science is about falsifiability, is characterised by falsifiability. Even at the lowest levels, we can't ever prove our theories, even silly little theories about all ravens being black, because we can't have observed every raven that there is. Uh, and famously, people in Europe assumed that all, all swans, taking another bird, were white. And then uh, it turned out that uh, when Captain Cook went to Australia, uh, this wasn't the, this, there was a refutation. And Popper said, yeah, science is not about induction. It's not about establishing theories on the basis of evidence. It's about falsifiability. Uh, and so for him, the scientific revolution of the 20th century involving in particular Einstein's theory was exactly meat and drink to his view, which was, that, as I say, that science is characterised by its theories being falsifiable, that the only thing that you can say at any stage is that this theory, although falsifiable, has not yet been falsified. Uh, and uh, that's the, the contrast being, according to, to Popper, with theories like those of Marx, Marx's theory of history, uh, Freud's theory of psychoanalysis, which, according to him, and this is obviously controversial, could accommodate any for not any, for not any observation. You could explain both the purpose of behavior in jumping in the, the, the lake to save the drowning child and in not doing that within a Freudian context. Anything could be explained. Whereas it, you, when it turns out that the Michelson-Morley experiment, a famous experiment that was done that supported Einstein's theory turned out that way, the way that Einstein predicted and counter to the way that Newton had predicted, that was the end, end of the story. Newton's theory gets falsified. Einstein's theory is, get, is accepted in its place. It's e equally or more falsifiable than, than uh, Newton's theory, uh, but it, unlike Newton's theory, it ev evades eventual refutation, because for many year, decades and decades, Newton's theory, according to Popper, was not falsified. And that's why it continued to be accepted. So the rationale for theory change in science is very straightforward, according to Popper. The theory, for a long time, it is accepted uh, because despite the fact that it can clash with observation results, it fails actually to do so. It gets all the observation results correct. Uh, and then along comes another theory uh, that says that certain uh, experiments will turn out differently than the, the way that Newton predicted they would, and this leads to a falsification of Newton's theory, 
and a confirmation or corroboration in Popper's terms of, of Einstein's theory. Uh, now, this, this is obviously the, there's more detail in Popper's voluminous works, starting in 1934 with the Logique de Fourchon. Uh, but this is basically certainly the picture that people got from Popper, and it's central to what he's talking about. In 1962, uh, Thomas Kuhn wrote a famous and very influential book called The Structure of Scientific Revolutions, which really, although not directly addressed at Popper, really does uh, form, if you like, a falsification of Popper's own, own views. Uh, what Kuhn pointed out was that this is the scientists don't operate the way that you that you would expect that they do according to Popper in looking for refutations and once they get a refutation that is some observational result which clashes with their theories they give up the theory. Uh, in fact ironically Popper had emphasized one episode himself that, uh, that that shows that this view of falsifications is is incorrect. Kuhn talked about scientists treating uh, apparently negative results as anomalies rather than refutations. So, for example, in the 19th century, when uh, Herschel discovered purely observationally a hitherto unsuspected planet called Uranus, uh, and New Newtonian physicists calculated what its, what its orbit should be, according to Newtonian theory, uh, it turned out that the orbit was, di was different, significantly different than was predicted on the basis of Newton's theory. So that sh looks like it should be a Popperian falsification. You've, you've deduced the consequence from the theory uh, about an observable event. You've looked at the observable event, namely the, the motion of, of, of Uranus, and that event has turned out to be different from what, uh, from what Newton's theory said it would be. So it should be a falsification, but that's not how people op operated at all. Uh, on the contrary, they said, no, Newton's theory must be true because it's been confirmed so often in the past. Uh, and so we must be making a, an, an incorrect assumption about an initial condition. Maybe there's another planet that we didn't, uh, still a further planet, because after all, Herschel had discovered a planet that people didn't know about before. Perhaps there's another planet that when we add its gravitational interaction with Uranus into the interaction with the sun and the other planets that we knew about already would give us the right, on, on the right account exactly on Newtonian principles. And in fact, they worked backwards and said, okay, well, what would we have to assume about the planet, this, this unsuspected planet? Because of course you can't just observe, observe that something's a planet. It's, it's a very slowly moving spot of light as far as we're concerned against the background of the fixed stars. Fixed stars are fixed relative to one another. The planets move, but they move very slowly, so you know, it's, not, it's not easy to spot planets. Uh, so it's perfectly conceivable that there's a uh, hitherto unsuspected planet around. Uh, so they work backwards from the, quote, refutation, or as Kuhn would have put it, anomaly with Uranus to make a prediction of a new planet. Uh, what would that new planet, where would it have to be, what would its mass have to be in order to account within Newtonian theory for the it, what had hitherto been the anomalous or ref refuting uh, behaviour of Uranus, and th this led to a prediction of the existence of Neptune, which was massively well confirmed. So that's not what, and there are lots and lots of cases, uh, Kuhn catalogues lots and lots of cases where uh, scientists treated uh, events and observations that were inconsistent with accepted theory as not being refutations, but as pointing to some auxiliary assumption, some initial condition, something more particular that we're assuming in order to test the theory, um, that that was what was wrong rather than the theory itself. Okay, and then Kuhn, him, so th now we come back to the issue of why uh, scientists changed them, or science collectively changed its mind in going from classical physics from Newtonian physics to Einsteinian theory. It can't be uh, as straightforward as Popper was suggesting that it's a, a, a case of a refutation of Newton uh, in, a, in an experiment that Einstein's theory gets correct. Uh, it must be something else. Now, Kuhn, again, this is all subject to scholarly discussion and so on, but the basic message that Kuhn seemed to be giving in the book was that there are no reasons why scientists change from what he called uh, one paradigm to another. Uh, it's, it, being converted is like 
uh, being, uh, is like a, in science, is like a religious conversion. It just happens in a gestalt. There's no, re there's no reason for, um, there's, there's, there's no set of universal principles of how evidence impinges on theory that will tell you when it's time to change a theory. And we just have to wait for the uh, previous, for the older scientists who stick to the old, older view. There are always odd people. There were people who stuck to cl classical physics even though, even though the, most of their colleagues switched to Einstein. We just have to wait for those people to die out. There aren't any, there aren't any rules. Now, uh, I think, to, to introduce a third philosopher, na namely Imre Lakatos, that Lakatos actually solved this problem. Uh, he accepted that Kuhn's theory, Kuhn's account, is much more accurate in terms of the way that scientists operated, in particular accepted that st scientists standardly treat negative instances not as Popperian falsifications but as Kuhnian anomalies and uh, he accepted that but said that Kuhn's theory was much too social constructivist, much, it, you know, science really does have genuine general rules and the important thing to look at is not for falsification but for verification. You can always hold on to a theory um, when clashes with the facts by modifying auxiliary assumptions in the way that Adams and Leverrier were the two people who independently postulated the existence of Neptune. You can always do that, but it's only scientific if in the process you make a new prediction that gets confirmed. So that's exactly what happened. It wasn't just that you accommodated the, uh, the negative data from Uranus within classical physics. Uh, you also predicted the existence of Neptune. If you predict the existence of a new planet, you, you, that's a testable assumption, and it turned out to be correct. The contrast is with, for example, explaining the null result of the michelson morley experiment, which was an important confirmation of, of special theory of relativity, by postulating in a completely ad hoc way uh, that rods are contracted in the direction of motion. You, you, let me give you a simpler example from from, from biology of the sort of thing what you mean by ad, ho ad hocness. Um, so there's this problem, if you believe, as creationists believe, the contrary to Darwin, that the universe was created in 4004 BC, you've got all these fossils that seem to be massively older than that, you've got all these trees that seem to be massively older than that, you've got decayed uh, rates of decay in radioactive samples that seem to indicate the universe has been around for millions and millions of years, not, not, not 6,000. But Goss said, no, that's easy to explain. Uh, you just assume that God created the universe with a lot of things looking already very old. So he created the fossils in the rocks. Uh, and that's the sort of typical, uh, completely anti-scientific reaction to a falsification, that you're just accommodating the data. You can see that there's no possible way that you can further test Goss's hypotheses. It just accommodates the data. And that's something that, according to Lakatos, I think he was right, Kuhn missed that there is a difference between treating an anomaly in a non-scientific way, just absorbing it within your fr framework because you're committed to the theoretical framework and getting an absorption that leads, to, however, to a new, uh, to a, a new prediction. So Lakatos's account is that the Einstein re Einsteinian revolution occurred not because its predecessor was refuted, as Popper would have said, while Einstein wasn't, but that Einstein scored independent success, for example, with the michelson morley experiment when it comes to the general theory of relativity, with the observations that two stars that are given distance apart during the day, or uh, sorry, during the night time, uh, will be a different distance apart uh, during the day. You can't usually observe stars in the day, but of course you can with an eclipse, and Einstein predicted exactly where uh, the, the, the distance that the two consecutive stars would be. So. Scientific progress is the key, N new testability is the key. Lakatos gives you an account that corrects Popper but doesn't go to the extreme of Kuhn and it all being a question of what, so what scientists decide to take without, decide to do without there being any general rules for theory change.